Hi there, thanks for clicking on and watching. Welcome to this video. Hopefully you've done so because you're sitting maths IGCSE this summer and this is going to be a walkthrough of the January 22 1H, the higher paper. I'm going to do the first half in this video and then make a second video with the second half. Okay, so let's get started. So at this stage in the course, you've maybe finished uh, learning all the content of the course and you're now you're focusing on putting it all together and looking at some past papers. When you do your maths exam, up to about a third of the exam will be problem solving, you having to apply your knowledge. But there are lots of questions where you can just practice the routines, rehearse what's needed to answer the, that particular question. And you're going to do that by doing lots and lots of past papers. Okay, here's number one then, and number one is rules of indices. Easy enough if you know the rules. So here we've got a to the seven times a to the four. So a to the seven means a times by itself seven times, and then you are continuing to times a times by itself another four times. So the rule here is because the number in the air just counts how many times it's being times by itself, you just add those indices. So I've drawn them all out so you can see what you're doing, but really you're just going to do 7 plus 4 and that is going to be a to the 11. Now when you are dividing we've got w times by itself 15 times on the top divided by 3 times on the bottom. Now because divide is the opposite of times those three on the bottom are going to cancel with three on the top. And what happens here is you're just going to take away the indices. So 15 take away three is going to be W to the 12. Now, anything outside the bracket is going to operate on everything inside the bracket. And we have got eight squared. And then we've got times X to the five all squared times Y cubed all squared. So 8 squared is going to be 64. Now the rule is when you've got a power of a power, you multiply those two numbers. So that's going to be x to the 10. And then y cubed all squared, you're going to multiply the 3 and the 2 as well. And that's going to be y to the 6. So the 8 squared, because there's not a power of power, that is the normal squaring to give us the 64. But when there's two powers, a power of a power, you multiply those two powers together. Now, part D, we're trying to make T the subject. Now, we're looking at the side where T is. It's T cubed minus 8V. So you've got to unravel and try and get that T on, on its own. So what's happening to T is we are cubing it and then we are taking 8v and we need to unravel and do the opposite so you need to add 8v and then take the cube root so that minus 8v needs to go to the other side so the first line we might do is c plus 8v will give us t cubed and then to get t on its own we need to take the cube root of both sides to get the t is equal to the cube root of C plus 8V. Number two is a ratio problem. We've got Daniel, Gabriel and Hadley sharing some money in the ratio 3 to 5 to 9. Now it's important that you read it in the order of the question. So we've got D, G and H in the ratio 3 to 5 to 9. Now, sometimes you're given an amount and you have to share it in that ratio, but you need to, need to read this question clearly because it says the difference between the amount Gabriel receives and Hadley receives is 196. Now, looking at Gabriel and Hadley, one receives five and one receives nine. And the difference between them is going to be nine shares minus five shares, which is four shares. And it's saying the difference between the amount that they get is 196. So that's telling us that four shares is equal to 196. So it's not your typical sharing in the ratio. So we need to do 196 divided by four to get that one share is equal to 196 over four, which is 
49. Work out the amount that Daniel gets. Now Daniel gets three shares, so three times 49, which is going to be 147. Number three contains a right angle triangle. Now, as soon as you see that, you know you're going to be using Pythagoras' theorem or trigonometry. Now, Pythagoras involves just lengths, but trigonometry involves angles. So I can see I've got an angle here, so I'm going to be using trigonometry. So there's three different buttons that you will press on your calculator. The sign button. And sign is opposite over hypotenuse. The cos button, cos is adjacent over hypotenuse. And the tan button, the tan is equal to opposite over adjacent. So you might have heard of so, car, toa. But writing them out in the formula triangles with S-O-H, C-A-H, and T O A, you're going to write it out anyway. So put the middle bit in the air, and then these operate like formula triangles because in a trigonometry question, you are given two things we've got the side and an angle. And the formula triangle works that you're given two of the um, parts of the formula triangle, you have to work out the third. So you have to label your triangle in relation to the angle. And this is the opposite, opposite the angle. Opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse. The other side is the adjacent. And that's not involved in my triangle, so I'm not going to write it on the triangle. So I'm looking for a ratio that involves O and H. Now, O and H, A and H, O and A, they all relate to sides. The sine, the cos and the tan relate to the angle. And I can see I've got opposite and hypotenuse. It's going to be this button that I'm going to be pressing on my calculator. Now, the formula triangle operates as you can cover up whichever you're trying to find. I'm trying to find a, B here, so that is the opposite. Now, because these two things on the bottom are next to each other, that's going to tell me to do a time sum. If I was trying to find the hypotenuse, because opposite over sine, you'd be doing a divide sum. So here, the opposite, A, B, is equal to sine 65, you need to close those brackets on your calculator, times the hypotenuse, 8.4. Now, if you do that on your calculator, you get 7.6129. Now, it wants it to three significant figures. That's three numbers regardless of the decimal place. You just look next door. That's a two, so it's going to leave the one alone. So the answer is 7.61. This next question involves quite a lot to read and take on board. It's a problem solving question. We've got Sarah making and selling mugs. One day she makes 150 mugs. The total cost is 1140. Of the mugs, we've got small, medium and large. Two fifths of the 150 mugs she makes are small. 32 are medium, the rest are large. So. Two fifths of 150 is the same as 40% because 20% is a fifth. 40% are going to be small. 32% are going to be medium. If we add them together, that's 72. If the rest are large to make up the 100%, 28 are large. So we need to work out 40% of 150. Well. 10% is 15 and four of them is going to be 60 mugs and they are small. Then we've got 32% of the 150 and that is going to be 48. Now to find a percentage, you're going to do 32 divided by 100. That's percent of in maths means times 150. So on your calculator, do 32 divided by 100. Now when you divide by 100, you could possibly do that sum in your head because dividing by 100 with the two zeros 
we're going to move that decimal place back two places. So that 0 0.32 times the 150 gave us the 48 mugs. Now the 28%, if we do 0 0.28 times 150 because that would be 28 percent that's going to tell us there were 42 mugs that were large so now we know how many of each type of mugs she made and the 60 the 48 and the 42 is going to add to our 150 mugs but then she sells them at all these different prices so 60 mugs at £8.50 is going to be 60 times £8.50 which gives her £510. Then we've got 48 mugs and she sells them at £11.20. Do that on your calculator, that's £537.60. And then she's got uh, 42 mugs at the large price, which is £14.20, which on your calculator gives you £596.40. So how much profit did she make by all these sales? If you add them all together, that comes to 1644. Now that's how much money she made compared to how much it cost her to make them. So if you take them away from each other, 1644, and take away the 1140, that will give you the profit she made, which is £504. Now, to find the percentage profit, you get how much she's made, 504, and you put it as a fraction of how much it cost her to make them. So you're going to do 504 divided by 1140. So that's making the the profit that she's made as a fraction of what it cost her and times that by 100 and that's going to give you 44.2% and to the nearest whole number that's 44%. Okay, number five, we've got Jenny having six cards. The lowest number is five, which is already filled in for us. The highest number is 24. And it's telling us the median has to be 14. Now, the six cards, the median is the middle value. So if I come in three from this way and three from this way, the median is going to sit there and we're told that the median is 14. Now, when the median is between two values, it means that it's going to be halfway between them. And what you can do to find that is find the average of those two numbers. So you could have 14 and 14, and then the median would be 14. You could have um, 13 and 15, and then halfway between them is going to be also 14. But we're also told that the mode is 8. So the mode means it's the number that occurs most often. So we're going to have to have some 8s there. And because this next one is like got to be under 14 we'll have to have another 8 there because we need more than one 8 so then to make 14 be the middle of these two then this number will have to be 20 because 20 plus 8 and half of that is going to give 14 in the middle then this last number can be anything between 20 and 24 because we've got no other restrictions so you could actually have any value there you could have um 21, 22, 23. You couldn't have 20 or 24 because that would not make the mode being 8. Right, the next part, part B, we've got a basketball team playing six games. Now, when they've played the first five games, they've got a mean score of 21. So the sum total, all the scores over the five games, that when we divide by five, we get 21. So what must this total be? Something divided by 5 is 21. The total must be 21 times 5. So that's going to be 105. Now, when we've played six games, the mean is now 23. So there's some new total that when we've divided by 6 is 23. So how are we going to get that total? You're going to do 23 times 6 just need to take that 6 to the other side and 23 times 6 is going to give us 138 
So 138 divided by 6 gives us the mean of 23. So after we've played the five games, we've added them all up, it's 105. When we've played our sixth game, the new total has gone up to 138. So work out the number of points the team scored in the sixth game. It must be 138 minus 105. So 138 minus 105 is 33. And that's your answer. When you see an inequality sign, you're going to treat it like it's an equal sign. And how would we solve the equation 5x minus 7 equal to 2? You would do the opposites. You would be adding 7 to both sides to get that 5x is equal to 9. And then you'd be dividing by 5. So you're going to do exactly the same. But instead of writing equals, you're going to write the inequality sign. So you, first of all, you're going to add 7. So 5x would be less than or equal to 9. And then we're going to divide by 5. x is going to be less than or equal to 9 divided by 5. You can just put it underneath. So that's telling us that x has got to be less than or equal to 1. Eight, or you can just leave it as nine fifths. Now, when we factorize, factorizing means putting the brackets back in. So, in order to get y squared, you need a y and a y. And then, if you're expanding the brackets, whether you use foil or crab's claw or, or um, smiley face, whatever, then it is going to be these two numbers here that times together to give us the minus 35. So because this is minus, that's telling me that the signs must be different. So you're thinking of two numbers that times together to give you minus 35. And then when we do the outers and the inners, they're going to collect together to add to give us minus 2. So numbers that times together to give you 35, you're going to think 7 and 5. You just need to put them in so that you've got more minus than plus. So I'm going to put the minus 7 there and the plus 5 there. So when I expand them out, here I'm going to get minus 7y and here I'll get plus 5y and those will go together to give us the minus 2y in the middle. So the answer is y plus 5 times y minus 7. Now the next part is exactly the same as what we've just done but equal to 0. So in order to solve a quadratic, you have to factorise because it says hence solve and that means you have to use what you've just worked out. And we've worked out that the factorised form is y plus 5 and y minus 7. So that's equal to 0. Now these, when you've got the two brackets, are two things times together because next to each other in maths means times. And then all you need to do is think what value will make this bracket zero. So y would have to be minus five. And what value would make that bracket zero? So it's or y is equal to seven. So you to answer it, you're just choosing values to make these brackets zero, which um, when you've just got a single y is just the opposite of what's going to be in that bracket. So y is minus five or y equals seven. Now, it's really important that you just use the word or don't write the word and. Number seven, we've got a Venn diagram question. This sign here is the universal set, and it just means that all these numbers somewhere need to be on the diagram. Uh, this sign here means A and B. So that is the intersection. So that's telling me straight away I can fill in 5, 10, and 15. Now, when you have the dash, that means not B. And here we've got another dash, which means not in a. So not in B means it could be this section or this section. So we can't just go filling them in. We need to have a little think about what's going on here. So which numbers are not in B and also not in A? 7, 8 and 14. So if they're not in either of them, they can go on the outside and then go anywhere, 7, 8, and 14. Now, not in B, these numbers that are left need to go here because they'll be in this bit, 9, 11, 12, and 13. And then not in A must be this bit here, 14, 
four and six goes there. This is a standard form question. A and B are given in standard form and we need to times them together. Now, if you try and type these into your calculator using that times to the 10 with the box button, then these numbers are too large and your calculator can't do it. Quite often the exam board do that in order to make you not use your calculator and have to know what to do without your calculator. So A times B, we need to do 4.2 times 10 to the minus 24, continue to times 3 times 10 to the 1, 4, 5. Now when you're timesing, 3 times 4 times 5 is the same as 5 times 4 times 3, then the order doesn't matter. And you can see that we've got times throughout. So the numbers on the front, I'm going to do 4.2 times 3. And then the powers of 10, I'm going to put them together because the order when you're timesing doesn't matter. They're still all times together. Now these, I can just times them together. So 4.2 times 3 on your calculator gives you 12.6 times. Now the rule is, remember in question 1, the rule is you add the indices. So you're going to do minus 24 plus 145. So this is going to be times 10 to the 121. Now it says give your answer in standard form. This is not in standard form because we've got 12.6. And what is standard about standard form? It starts in the units column. This starts in the tens column. So this number here at the start of, for a number to be in standard form must be either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 or 9. So what does it mean? 12.6 times 10 to the 1, 2, 1, it means we're going to move the decimal place 121 places. So it's going to come over the 6 and then you're going to have 120 zeros. But in order to get it into standard form, we want the decimal place to go there. So it's going to be 1.26. Now, because we actually want to make it have an extra jump, so it's going to be the same length, it's going to be times 10 to the 122. So I've done that without using that button. Okay, next one, the area of a triangle is equal to half base times height. Because we've got an isosceles triangle, we can drop a line down the middle and that's going to give us our height. Because it's isosceles, that's then split the base up into 14 and 14. And then in one of those triangles, we can then find the height because we can apply Pythagoras. Now, height is going to be one of the short sides. So you're going to do Pythagoras' theorem with a takeaway type. So you're going to do 17.5 squared minus 14 squared is equal to h squared. So if you do that on your calculator, 17.5 squared minus 14 squared equals, and then take the square root of that, h comes out to be 10.5. And then the area is going to be half times base times height, which is half times the base. You're going to use all of 28 times 10.5. So do that on your calculator. You're going to get 147. And then look at the units. It's going to be centimetres squared. Number 10, you cannot find the gradient unless you've got y the subject. So 2y is going to equal minus 7x plus 10. And then y will equal dividing both the terms on the other side by 2, minus 7 over 2x plus 10 over 2, which is equal to minus 7 over 2x plus 5. So once you've got y the subject, the gradient is just the number in front of x. So it's going to be minus 7 over 2 or minus 3.5. Where does it cross the y-axis? Well, now we've got it in y equals mx plus c form, m being the gradient and c being the y-axis intercept. We can just pull off that 
that's five is going to be the y-axis intercept and to be on the y-axis at five the coordinate will be zero and then five up this is a compound interest question so just have a look at a little simpler example to explain what's going on with the values before we start because this is quite a hard question to get your head around if i had 500 pounds and i had a rate of interest of 10 percent what would i times it by you could find 10 percent which would be 50 and add it on or you can times by one which give would give me 500 and then if i times by 1.1 one zero. Oh, that's going to add me the 10% on so that would give me the 550 so whatever the percentage increase is you can use what we call a multiplier and put the percentage increase as a decimal and then times it by one point and then that decimal so here we've got 200,000 pounds being invested it's a 1.8 percentage increase for the first year and then for the second and third year there's a new rate of interest that applies to both of those second and third years and the value at the end of the three years is 209754 so to begin with to add on the 1.8 percent we're going to do 200,000 times 1 point zero one eight and that's putting the one point eight as a decimal one point eight percent is one point eight over a hundred which is going to move that decimal two places so there it is there one point oh one eight now if you do that that comes out to be two oh three six hundred now this is what we would have at the start of the second year and we'd be doing 203600 times a one point something that we don't know and we'd actually be squaring that because we want to do it for two years which is going to be the second and third year and the answer is going to be what we're given in the question 209754 we need to work out what this is here so what we're going to do is 203600 times that gives us our answer. So the thing that we're looking for is going to be 209754 divided by 203600. Because it's joined there by a times, so we're going to take to the other side and it's going to do the opposite. It's going to be a divide. So 209754 divided by 203600 is going to be... 1.030 so that is what this is going to be this value here when we've squared it is this answer here so all we need to do to that answer is to square root it and that comes out to tell us that x is going to be or this value here is 1.015 and that's going to tell me that this is going to be my percentage and putting the decimal place back in it's going to be that it's 1.5 percent when you're calculating cumulative frequency you add it up as you go down the list so how many people took under 10 minutes there were seven people so seven needs to go in there how many people took from naught to 20 so that's all of these two groups you just need to add in the 26 and 7 plus 26 is going to be 33 and then we need to add in the next one because it goes from naught to 30 so 33 plus 24 is going to be 57 then we add in the next one 14 which is going to be 71 then the next one add seven and then the last one add two is going to be 80 and it tells us that we're 80 customers so we've got 80 by the time we've got to the end of the list now using our cumulative frequency we now need to draw a cumulative frequency graph so cumulative frequency is on the y-axis and these times refer to these times here now you've accumulated seven by the time you get to the end of the group so you need to plot 10 the end of the group with seven up and then 20 the end of the next group with 33 
and then the next one 30 with 57 and then 40 with 71 50 with 78 and then 60 with 80. Now you're going to always extend it back to the beginning so it's going to have zero and then it's going to have a nice s-shaped curve joining all the crosses up use your graph to estimate the median now if there's been 80 people that you've accumulated you're going to find the median by going along halfway and reading down so the median i think there is looks like about 22 uh, then the next bit, one of the 80 customers is chosen at random. Use your graph to find an estimate for the probability of this time taking more than 42 minutes. So you need to go to 42 and read up. I think that goes to 72. What's the probability that it's more than that? That's going to be how many above? So that's 8 out of 80, which is going to be 1 10th. Okay, number 13, we've got to expand these three terms. Now, when you're multiplying in maths, order doesn't matter. Uh, we need to multiply them out because they're all next to each other and next to each other in maths means multiply. I'm going to multiply the two brackets first and whether you use crab's claw, smiley face or foil, it's a system so that you can multiply everything in the first bracket by everything in the second. So first means the two first things in the bracket and they're multiplied together is going to give us 3x squared. O is for outers, which is the x times the minus 4, which is minus 4x. Then the inners, which is plus 6x. And then the last, which is minus 8. Now, when you do FOIL, if you do it in that order, these two terms can then collect. So we're going to have 3x squared down 4x up 6x, which is going to give us plus 2x minus 8. And then we've still got the 5x on the front. Now, 5x on the front is going to multiply by everything in the bracket. So 5 times 3 is 15x cubed because you've got single x times x squared. And that's going to give you x cubed plus 10x squared and then minus 40x. Now, in part B, there's quite a lot going on here. You've got a minus on the index and you've also got a fraction. So if I explain what a minus means first and just think about something a bit more simple than that actual question. If I had, for instance, 3 to the minus 2, what does that minus actually mean? Well, if I think of a sum that would give me the answer 3 to the minus 2, you could have 3 squared over 3 to the 4 because when you're doing indices you're going to take those away from each other because we've got 3 times by itself twice on the top and then we've got 4 on the bottom two of those on the top will cancel with 2 on the bottom so it's going to give us 1 over 3 squared so the fact that you've got a minus just means that when you did the takeaway here, there were more on the bottom. So 3 to the minus just means 1 over 3 squared. So to the minus means 1 over the positive power. Now, this fraction is going to operate on everything in the bracket top and bottom. So the minus is going to mean the 16w to the 8 really goes underneath. And because the y20 is already underneath, that is actually going to go on, on top. So the minus just means that we need to turn what's inside the bracket upside down. So this is going to be the same sum as y to the 20 over 16w to the 8 all to the 3 quarters. So getting rid of that minus, we do by just turning what's in the bracket upside down. Now when you have a fraction as an index, 
on the top means normal power and underneath means root. So if I had um, 9 to the half, because this 2 is underneath, that is the same as the square root of 9. But we've got here the fourth root. So what you have to do is on the bottom, that 3 quarters needs to act on the 16 and on the 8. Now the fourth root of 16 is going to be 2. So we've dealt with the root and 2 then cubed is going to be 8. Then what we've got is um, a power of a power. So if I've got 2 cubed or squared, when you've got two powers together, you're going to multiply them together. So that would be 2 to the 6. And this is what we have to do here with the w to the 8 or to the 3 quarters, we have to multiply them together. And 1 quarter of 8 is 2 and then 3 of them is going to be 6. So that's w to the 6. And then on the top, we have got y to the 20 all to the three quarters. And the rule again is that you multiply those powers. So one quarter of 20 is going to be five, and five times three is 15. So you're going to have y to the 15 on the top. Next question is a probability tree diagram question, and we've got two events picking a seed from packet A and packet B. So the outcome is always at the end of the branches and the probabilities are on the branches. We have got the probability of getting a sunflower is seven out of 12. 12 seeds in packet A, seven are sunflowers, so it's gonna be seven out of 12. Now, when the branches all come from one place, these two probabilities have to add up to one because you're either going to get a sunflower or not a sunflower. So not a sunflower to make that add up to one is five twelfths. And then we're told there's 15 seeds in B and eight are sunflower. So the probability here is going to be eight out of 15 and not a sunflower to make the branches add up to one again is going to be seven out of 15. And then we can just repeat those probabilities here because this second set of branches underneath is just going to be on the basis that the first one was not, so the probabilities for that second pick remain the same. So that's two marks for filling the tree in. Then in part B, what is the probability of getting two sunflowers? So we want the probability of sunflower and sunflower. Now that word and in probability means we need to multiply and you need to find a route through the branches that uh, gives us what we want, which is sunflower and sunflower. So we need to multiply these two numbers together. So that's going to be 7 twelfths times 8 over 15. And we can see that can cancel or we can do it on our calculators. 4s into 8 goes twice, 4s into 12 goes 3. 7 times 2 is 14 and 3 times 15 is 45. So the answer is 14 out of 45. Well done. If you're still with me at this point, that was the first half of the paper. I'm going to do another video with the second half. So do please check out the channel, like and subscribe and I will see you on the next one.